The book of Romans is the first of the epistles in the New Testament. Of course, the New Testament begins Matthew, Mark, Luke, and John. Those are the four Gospels. Immediately following the Gospels is the book of the Acts of the Apostles. As we've learned here recently, Acts is the second book in a two-book uh, continuum, which is made up of the book of Luke, the Gospel according to Luke, and the book of Acts. Acts follows uh, chronologically from the book of Luke, though in the ordering in the scriptures, uh, John comes between the two. Then after the book of Acts, uh, the sixth book of the New Testament is the book of Romans. Romans is widely regarded as Paul's most carefully considered, theoretically sophisticated, and theologically important writing. Composed near the end of his ministry and containing his mature reflections on the Christian faith, the letter's impact on subsequent Christian history has been enormous, especially as a source for the Reformation doctrine of justification by faith. As United Methodists, it's interesting to know that the influence of Romans upon John Wesley is evidenced throughout his writings, most famously in this journal entry, which we discussed at Bible study this past Thursday evening. And I want to invite you to join us for Bible study on the book of Romans throughout the summer, every Thursday at 7 p.m. In the evening, John Wesley writes, I went very unwillingly to a society in Aldersgate Street, where one was reading Luther's preface to the Epistle to the Romans about a quarter before nine. While he was describing the change which God works in the heart through faith in Christ, I felt my heart strangely warmed. I felt I did trust in Christ, Christ alone for salvation. An assurance was given me that he had taken away my sin, even mine, and saved me from the law of sin and death. These words from John Wesley's journals, the journal writing for May 24th, 1738. Wesley believed that Romans was written to show that neither Jews nor Gentiles could obtain justification before God, and that therefore it was necessary for both to seek it from the free mercy of God by faith and that God has an absolute right to show mercy on what terms God pleases. Without disavowing these points, many scholars today argue that the more central issue in Romans is the ultimate fate of unbelieving Israel, a serious theological problem with which Paul, a Jewish apostle to the Gentiles, wrestled prior to his final trip to Judea. Has God's plan failed? Can God truly be considered righteous and not save Israel? Paul's argument climaxes in chapter 11, verse 26, where he asserts all Israel will be saved and God's righteousness will be vindicated. We'll talk more about the themes in the book of Romans in the weeks ahead. Uh, but for now, I'm going to share with us this reading from chapter 1, verses 1 through 18. These words provide the introduction to the letter, a greeting, and a thanksgiving. From Paul, a slave of Christ Jesus, called to be an apostle and set apart for God's good news. God promised this good news about his son ahead of time through his prophets in the Holy Scriptures. His son was descended from David. He was publicly identified as God's son with power through his resurrection from the dead, which was based on the spirit of holiness. This son is Jesus Christ, our Lord. Through him we have received God's grace and our appointment to be apostles. This was to bring all Gentiles to faithful obedience for his name's sake. You who are called by Jesus Christ are also included among these Gentiles. To those in Rome who are dearly loved by God and called to be God's people. Grace to you and peace from God our Father and the Lord Jesus Christ. First of all, 
I thank my God through Jesus Christ for all of you because the news about your faithfulness is being spread throughout the whole world. I serve God in my spirit by preaching the good news about God's Son. And God is my witness that I continually mention you in all my prayers. I'm always asking that somehow by God's will, I might succeed in visiting you at last. I really want to see you, to pass along some spiritual gift to you so that you can be strengthened. What I mean is that we can mutually encourage each other while I'm with you. We can be encouraged by the faithfulness we find in each other, both your faithfulness and mine. I want you to know, brothers and sisters, that I plan to visit you many times, although I have been prevented from coming until now. I want to harvest some fruit among you, just as I have done among the other Gentiles. I have a responsibility both to Greeks and to those who don't speak Greek, both to the wise and to the foolish. That's why I'm ready to preach the gospel also to you who are in Rome. I'm not ashamed of the gospel. It is God's own power for salvation to all who have faith in God, to the Jew first and also to the Greek. God's righteousness is being revealed in the gospel from faithfulness for faith. As it is written, the righteous person will live by faith. Here ends this evening's reading from the scriptures. And so I've titled our thoughts for this evening, When in Rome, just because that's a, a very familiar saying that we often use, when in Rome, do as the Romans do. I think it's especially significant that we take a long, steady look at the Book of Romans throughout this coming summer in order that we might understand the teaching of Paul to the people of his day. And there are a number of reasons why I feel that this is especially poignant, but I want to lift up at least three. The first reason is because I'm a lectionary preacher. Uh, what that means is that over the course of three years, year A, year B, year C, uh, there is an establishment of texts to be read throughout the week and indeed each and every Sunday over the period of those three years. This assertion of texts is called the lectionary. We began year A in Advent of 2019. That means right around the end of November last year, we began lectionary year A. We considered the stories of the anticipation of the coming of Christ leading to the birth of Christ at Christmas during Advent. We considered the stories of the birth of Jesus Christ, primarily in the Gospels according to Matthew and Luke. We looked at the meaning and significance of Christ having been born uh, in the season of Epiphany. And then moving from Epiphany, we got involved in our self-inventory and journey through the season of Lent toward Easter. At Easter time, of course, just prior to Easter, we looked at the passion and suffering and death of Christ leading up to resurrection or Easter Sunday, uh, and we looked at the resurrection of Jesus Christ. Immediately after Easter, we spent 50 days thinking about the life of Christ after his resurrection. It is understood that Christ was living here in resurrected form for 40 days prior to his ascension to heaven. And then he gave promise to the apostles that he would send the advocate, the Holy Spirit, to be with them. And indeed, recently, just two weeks ago, we celebrated the birth of the church with the gift of the Holy Spirit 
at Pentecost, 50 days after Easter. Now we've entered into Pentecost and the lectionary texts focus throughout the summer for the months of June, July, August into September on Paul's epistle to the Romans. There are a number of different texts that are suggested to be read throughout the summer from the book of Romans. But rather than strictly following the lectionary, what I've chosen to do is to spend time week by week working through the book of Romans chapter by chapter. Today we're going to begin with Romans chapter 1 verses 1 through 18 and then next week we'll consider Romans chapter 1 verses 18 up till chapter 2. And then we'll read chapter 2 and chapter 3 and chapter 4 and so forth uh, throughout the summer so that we have a very close understanding of this great work that is so meaningful to so many. And we'll talk about why it's so meaningful to so many in the weeks ahead as well. So the first reason that I feel that it's appropriate that we look at the book of Romans in this way throughout this summer is because it is suggested by the lectionary. Secondly, however, I think it's important because we, the United States of America, are often regarded as one of the more successful experiments in human government that ever was. We're still relatively young compared to some great civilizations. Nevertheless, there is a worldwide understanding that to be an American is a great privilege, the home of the brave and the land of the free. Uh, nevertheless, there are also ways in which we feel that, that we've kind of gone back on that original integrity and determination that makes us who we are. And, and there are other ways in which we've never quite reached uh, that integrity that we esteem and desire. It would be very helpful for us to take a look at Rome in Paul's day and to think about the things that Paul had to say to the people of Rome in his day uh, and relate them to how Paul might speak to us today if he were speaking directly to us, to you and to me. Now, as we branch out as a society into an entirely new world in some ways after uh, the coronavirus, presuming that uh, it continues to uh, work itself out over these next couple of weeks and months. Uh, it's important for us to, to perhaps go back to the beginning as we move forward to the future. Many of the original formers of these United States had societies like that in Rome in mind. Uh, they learned a great deal from the Greco-Roman world as they settled and established a sense of who we would be as a nation. And so the second reason that I think it's important that we take a look at the book of Romans is because we are so much like the Rome of today. And finally, I feel that it's important that we take a look at this book of Rome, Romans because there are many, many people who have expressed uh, a similar sense of impression by the book of Rome, Romans and, and those texts associated with it, whether it be uh, Martin Luther's preface to the, to the book of Romans or, uh, or John Wesley's reflection on that preface as he had his Aldersgate experience or, or our brother Dan McDougall and his experience of the book of Rome. Romans that I'll have him share with you if he desires uh, as the book of Romans played heavily into his heart and into his life as he uh, remembered his mother at the time of her passing from this life to the next. And quite frankly, I personally uh, can give testimony about how the book of Romans has had an impact on my personal life and the life of my family. And so I want to invite you uh, to join me in this look at the book of Romans 
over the course of this next summer. We're going to look at it for, for 12 to 16 weeks, and we'll look at each of the chapters of the Book of Romans, some a little bit more in depth than others, but overall to develop a healthy sense for what the book is about and how it can inform us in our Christian journey, in our Christian life. Today, our reading is taken from Romans chapter 1, verses 1 through 18. I would simply remind you that the book of Romans is a letter. The word epistle means letter. And this is uh, the first uh, canonical book that is a letter that is recorded in the New Testament. To be clear, this is not the first historically this is not the first book that Paul ever wrote, the first letter that Paul wrote. Uh, the book of Romans was written someplace around 54 to 58 AD, and Paul wrote some of the letters prior to that, and he wrote some of the letters subsequent to that. Uh, nevertheless, this is probably the most influential, the most theologically mature, and the most uh, condensed and clear understanding of Paul's thinking that we can find in any of the letters of Paul. It is here first in the canon for a reason, and we might spend some time talking with each other about why it is first of the letters. But it is a letter, and so here in chapter 1 verses 1 through 18 we have the greeting. We have words of prayer and praise and thanksgiving. We have indications as to why the letter is written and where it is written and to whom it is written. Uh, we also have indications of uh, forms of letters that we have seen throughout the entire corpus of the scriptures. One of those can be found in chapter 1, uh, verse 7b. If you go to chapter 1, verse 7, and go to the second part of verse 7, you'll see there, grace to you from God and from our Lord and Savior Jesus Christ. Uh, here we have a greeting that is often offered in one of Paul's letters uh, that is customary, and, and so it speaks to us about the nature of the foundation upon which God's word was being expressed here by Paul in each of the letters. And so today, I just endeavor to give you an understanding as to why we're going to be spending our summer in Rome, and why we might consider that while we're in Rome, doing as the Romans do. And what do I mean by that? I want to encourage you to listen to these words of Paul throughout the summer, as though you were someone who lived in that context of Rome. Think about what was Paul trying to say to his original hearers, to those who heard his message first, and how does that relate to what perhaps Paul is saying to us today? Because when in Rome, we want to do as the Romans do.